Welcome to this demonstration of the Rational Integrated Solution for Application Portfolio Management. Here we're going to take a look at the combined capabilities of Rational Focal Point and Rational System Architects as applied to the Application Portfolio Management exercise. We're going to begin with by taking a look at the portfolio of applications as they are already documented within Rational Focal Point. And typically, your high-level uh, senior executives in the business, they will be interested in looking at a number of aspects of the portfolio. And in our example here, we've got a number of columns uh, that they can use as part of their dashboard. The first column is called Manage the Portfolio. And this is really concerned with the processes that are applied in actually looking at the number of applications that we've got, their status and their costings, etc. The second column is more concerned with managing the actual assessment process as we go through the various stages of the application portfolio management exercises. And the third column is all concerned with the management of the transformation of those applications from their current state into their proposed new states as um, uh, actions and decisions are taken against uh, the applications after they have gone through an application portfolio management exercise. So the first column gives us information which enables us to look at the portfolio of applications that we've got, the the projected costs and whether there are any cost overruns uh, associated with the cost of the applications versus uh, the expected and the actual costs uh, that have actually been uh, occurred. And similarly, we can look at the planned aggregated total cost versus the planned or the actual total cost of the applications and work out uh, if there are any deviations in there. Similarly, we can look at the applications and work out if uh, there are any uh, changes to the service level agreements uh, because the service level agreements do have a contributing factor to the overall cost of uh, the applications. The higher the service level agreement, the higher the cost of uh, maintaining and running those applications. And similarly, we've also got a distribution of what state those particular applications are in. So, for example, there's a certain percentage which are being active, or are, uh, applications which are active and being evolved, active and being maintained, or active at the end of life. The second column uh, that uh, we had, which was looking at the management of the actual assessment process, is more concerned uh, with the various stages that we go through in respect of the applications. And this is managing the process and the status of the various stages that we're in in that particular exercise. So, for example, of the applications that we may have, a certain percentage of those have not been assessed at the moment, or they may have been assessed, or they've been investigated, or um, investigation is to be done. Obviously, this type of information is only going to be available provided that we've gone through uh, an application portfolio management exercise at least through one cycle. For those applications that we have looked at and uh, we have made some decisions as to what we want to do with those, we may make certain proposals that we are going to uh, refactor or rehost or offshore those applications, etc. And this uh, particular stage in here manages and gives us a distribution of the various recommendations that we had made. As part of the application portfolio management exercise, we may also be given uh, certain uh, targets that we want to achieve, i.e. it's no longer just about uh, seeing what is the best sets of savings that we can make in terms of the numbers of applications and the numbers or the costings um, of those applications, but we may actually be given targets that we need to achieve. And these targets can be used to help us to drive out uh, the reduction in the overall cost of the application portfolio. Similarly, uh, we can use the tool to help us work out distributions of where we should invest in the applications or whether we should disinvest in the applications in there. 
and the net results of those um, applications and their assessments can be summarized in a number of different views which we'll take a look at later but on the dashboard we may come up with a very very simplified uh, classification of the value of those applications to the business and come up with some sort of um, investment star rating here so there's a certain number of applications which are uh, meet the needs of the business and there's a certain percentage which don't really meet the needs of the business and the third column which is to concern with the management of the transformation of the portfolio uh, tells us uh, where we are um, in terms of the actual transformation so we have gone through this iteration made a number of recommendations through uh, for the applications to be retired or replaced or renovated etc and as a result of that the actual implementation is uh, going to be managed through projects and their project life cycles so for example there may be a project uh, that has been proposed, uh, assessed, accepted, etc. And it is really the projects then uh, which deliver the decisions that have been made um, against the applications as we have gone through each one of those and assessed the value of those applications and uh, considered whether they can be uh, retired or uh, replaced, uh, etc. So the dashboard view gives us an overall uh, assessment and summary of the various stages of the applications and the various life cycle stages that we're in as uh, part of the assessment process so that we can see how much progress or lack of progress that we are making towards the targets that we're trying to achieve. The first stage in the APM exercise involves identifying an area of the business that uh, we want to focus on. Um, um, we want to do this simply because it's impossible to assess the many hundreds if not thousands of applications that may already exist in the portfolio and instead of trying to assess all of those applications we want to focus in on a certain subset and that subset may be driven by um, identification by the business that there are problematic areas or the fact that uh, there has been mergers and acquisitions exercises which have taken place which give rise to uh, duplicate to capabilities. However, um, I, outside of those areas, what we are able to do is to use the existing sets of information that we've got about the application portfolio and use that to hone in on certain areas of the portfolio that we could possibly investigate in more detail. And to do this, what we're going to do is to take a look at the existing set of applications that we've already got uh, within there. So let's take a look in here for the existing sets of applications and we're able to look at a number of different reports or take the existing information and slice and dice it uh, to give us some useful information. So for example, if we look at the current sets of applications that have already been uh, collected and uh, some sorts of assessment or information has already been collated about that, we're able to use that to give us, for example, a pie chart view of the spread of applications by their classification into whether they are legacy applications, strategic or tactical. So what we're able to see here is out of all the total numbers of applications uh, that there are something like about 68 70 percent of applications which are non-strategic therefore in terms of the numbers of applications uh, we've got uh, certain rich pickings here that we can possibly focus in on we can also take the same uh, information that we have here and also uh, look at it in a slightly different way and that is to look at it in terms of the total lifetime costs of those applications and also to display the information as a stacked bar chart and let's take a look at that so what this is now telling us is that out of all the tactical, strategic and legacy applications, it's the legacy applications which are having uh, or um, are uh, taking up the most total lifetime cost. And in the total sets of those applications, if we look at the number of uh, portfolios that we've got, we can see that it's the risk control portfolio here which has got the greatest number uh, of uh, application costs being incurred over the lifetime of those applications. Therefore, if we want to focus in on a certain part of the business where we suspect there may be opportunities for uh, rationalizing the portfolio of applications, then risk control looks like a good uh, 
uh, area to start looking in further detail at. And that's what we're going to do in the next uh, stage. So let's just take a look at what applications we do have in those. And we can see that we've got a number of applications which are part of the risk control portfolio. Now, if I take on the hat of a business analyst, I uh, can start looking at these applications and start collecting information to enable us to make some assessments. So as part of the life cycle of the progression of these applications, if I look at those applications which have been assigned to me for uh, particular actions, I can just look at the ones which have been specific to me. And in here, what we're able to do is to see a um, simplified view of application information uh, that I'm expected to go out and collect. And this is uh, uh, important because it's at the early stages of the collection of the information that we want to make sure that we're only collecting the relevant and pertinent information which is going to help us to make a decision. What we don't want to do is to collect all uh, sets of attributes or all sets of measures uh, that we are likely to be wanting to use, but rather only focus on those which are going to be used at this particular point in the stage of the uh, assessment process. So as I'm expected to be able to go away and find out uh, by discussion with the business, I would want to go in there and determine what's the degree of business alignment of this particular application that we've got. And this can be uh, determined by a relative value in here. And in our example, we're going to say that the degree of business alignment is quite low. How critical is this application to the business? Similarly, we're going to say it is not so high in terms of its criticality to the business. What are the risks associated with either changing this application or not changing it? It can be deemed to be quite high. And from a technical assessment, I, what's the degree of alignment uh, with the IT uh, architectures that we have? In this example, we're going to say it's very low. And also, what's the degree of risk associated with either changing the application or not changing the application? In this example, we can say it's quite high. So those assessments that we are making are formulated to give us overall total business alignment scores and total IT uh, scores. And we can use these total scores to help us to work out um, which applications we should take to the next stage of evaluation and uh, uh, assessment uh, to determine what action and recommendations uh, that we may want to make to those. As part of the application assessment exercise, we're also controlling the stages of the applications by having what we call an assessment state. And the assessment state gives us a way of controlling who has access to the application at what particular point in time of the assessment cycle. So I, in the capacity of a business analyst, am currently assessing uh, the um, applications and collecting information against those. Now that I'm happy uh, with the information that I've collected, I can make the application progress to the next stage, which is that it is now ready for review, i.e. comparison with the other applications that we've got in order to be able to make some sort of assessment as to whether we want to investigate those in greater detail or whether uh, we will discard with these because this particular application meets the needs of the business. So let's select the uh, or progress this to the next stage in the life cycle here. And when we do this, that view indicates to us that um, there are no further applications that are uh, visible to me uh, for any further assessment in here. Having collected some preliminary information in respect of the applications, we're now in a position to be able to compare uh, the applications with one another to determine their relative fit to the needs of the business. There are a number of ways that we can do this. And one of those uh, ways is to be able to visualize the applications and look at those in a XY plot. So for example, here uh, we have got the applications uh, which are spread out. And remember the total IT scores and the total uh, business scores that we had are indicated here respectively. So the total business score is shown on the y-axis and the IT score is shown here on the x-axis. So 
what this is telling us is that applications which fit into this quadrant are those applications which are well aligned to the needs of the business and also are well architected. Similarly, applications which fall to the bottom left-hand quadrant are uh, poorly aligned to the needs of the business and also are poorly architected. And these are potentially applications uh, that we could uh, consider for removal, uh, retirement or, uh, uh, or replacement uh, with alternatives. Whereas those applications uh, which fit into the top uh, left-hand corner, they meet uh, the needs of the business uh, in the respect that they are required for the business but are poorly architected. So these uh, applications are potentially good applications for consideration for modernization and uh, renovation, etc. If we had any applications which uh, sat over into this quadrant here, then those applications would have uh, poorly met the needs of the business but would have been well architected. So we can use this uh, XY plot as a as an early way of being able to identify those applications uh, that we want to invest in and those applications which we want to retire and those applications which we may want to modernize and renovate. We can take a look at the same uh, sets of information that we have here but view it in a uh, stacked bar chart view. And the stacked bar chart view gives us very similar information to the XY plot that we were looking at, but what it's also uh, able to do is to uh, give us the relative rankings of those applications as well. So, for example, those applications which fit uh, towards the top of uh, the uh, view in here are those applications which are ranked the highest, whereas those at the bottom, they're ranked the poorest. But the assessment of those applications uh, is shown here where the relative measurements that we've taken are uh, accumulated to give us the overall ranking. So, for example, uh, the degree of IT alignment, the degree of business criticality, um, etc. are all positive measurements, whereas uh, the business risk, the IT risk and the total annual cost are negative factors that we are taking into account. Hence why... Uh, the negative factors and the positive factors, their net effect is indicated by these uh, black triangle indicators that we've got. And we can use this uh, view in here to help us to work out uh, the weightings that we may want to apply to these relative measurements that we've got. So, for example, if we're not too concerned about IT risk, we can remove this from the equation and see how that impacts uh, the overall rankings that we've got in here also uh, take a look at the various uh, scenarios that we've got and uh, adjust the various scenarios, view what the information would look like or the rankings would look like if we were to change the percentage contributions of those. So what we're now going to do is, um, in our example here, we're pretty confident that these applications which are towards the top end they're the ones that we're happy with and we don't really want to consider or investigate these further as uh, candidates for uh, retiring or uh, removing. So for this set of applications, we're going to accept those and say that uh, well, we're going to remove those. So let's switch those off from here. And edit those. And for those applications that uh, we have uh, checked, uh, we are going to change um, their assessment state from the current state to say investigation done. So at this stage, uh, the simple investigation has been completed for those and we are not going to investigate those in any more detail. Whereas those applications which are at the bottom end before we start making any decisions, we're going to investigate those in more detail. And by in investigating those in more detail, what we're going to do is to say uh, that they should be investigated in much more detail. So do a deep dive investigation, which means that we will take into account additional uh, metrics uh, that we want to assess against those. So, for example, now, if we're looking at those applications, 
to do a deep dive investigation, we're going to not only just look at those simple um, uh, metrics that we had in terms of the uh, business assessments that we had, the degree of business alignment, business criticality, but we may now want to factor in what's the user base, the availability, the impact uh, on the outage, etc. And in respect of the technical assessments, uh, we may want to start looking at the staffing profiles or the uh, uh, size of those applications or the defect rates, etc. And those are going to be what we call the sort of deep dive investigations because we don't want to just simply make a, a decision on the recommendations that we're going to make against those applications based on the simple uh, metrics that we collected in the first place. Whilst we can use these measurements here as a way of measuring uh, the value of these applications to the business, that alone is insufficient. And what we also need to do is to investigate or have an appreciation of uh, the impact of uh, any proposed changes to the business architecture. And uh, by that, what we mean is who's actually using these applications? What business processes are those applications supporting? Is there a requirement to change the business processes and the skill sets of those people who are using those applications if we are making any proposals to change or renovate or revise um, any of those applications in there? And to aid us in this, uh, we're able to use System Architect. And System Architect is a way of uh, being able to model and understand, for example, uh, the business organizational aspects, i.e. what organizational units do we have, how do they break down, and what skill sets do the personnel have within those organizational units. But for those organizational units, uh, they are using particular business processes, and so we can use uh, the models that we've built in here to understand which users are uh, deploying or using which particular processes. However, as part of that uh, particular business process, they may be using a number of applications. And by having an understanding of uh, the users, the organizational aspects, the technologies, the processes, the applications, we can create these types of explorer diagrams. And these uh, uh, explorer diagrams give us an opportunity to be able to understand the rich um, sets of interdependencies and relationships that there exist between the capabilities of the business, uh, the users, the processes, and the applications. So, for example, if we're making a proposal to change this particular application here, we can see that it's going to impact the risk control and the position management capabilities, and this particular application also supports the relationship management process. Therefore, any changes that we are making, we must be uh, conscious of the changes to the broader uh, business uh, organization and the impact that uh, that uh, changes may have on those and what remedial action uh, we need to take in order to uh, negate any effects or to accommodate uh, for the changes that we're making to the applications. So by using the Explorer diagram to understand the functionalities and the capabilities, we're in a better position to be able to make these types of uh, decisions before we go along and actually make any recommendations on whether we want to retire or replace those applications in there. One of the additional capabilities that's also offered by System Architect is the ability to be able to create what we call a future state and compare that with the current state. I, if we were to make the changes to the applications and uh, or make proposals to change those applications, how will the organizational units look like? What will the business uh, processes be? What technology will there be? So we can architect uh, the way that we would like to have the business in the future. And we can come up with a number of different solutions or a number of different scenarios. And we can weigh and assess the relative uh, merits of each one of those scenarios against each other. So we're not just looking at the application in isolation, we're looking at the application in the context of how it supports the rest of the business. And these alternative scenarios, we can investigate and uh, look at the, the costings and the value of those to the business. And we can also use the tool to help us to work out what changes required to the organization. And there is a capability here called the System Architect Encyclopedia Compare, which looks at what the business is organized currently 
versus how it is going to be in the future. So for example, in here, uh, I know that there are some applications that we've been making changes to or proposing the changes to, and we can look at those. So in our example here, GMFS Risk Control is an application that uh, we could consider looking at replacing the ones that we've already identified. And what changes are there? Uh, in the technologies uh, that we require in order to be able to support this application versus the other applications uh, that are already there. Similarly, we can look at what data information is required in order to, to support the changes. And then finally, are there any new business rules uh, that are coming into place uh, which we want to look at and uh, uh, implement as part of the, the, the changes that we're making in here? And we can use these uh, deltas uh, between the current state and the future state to work out what the degree of investment and the degree of risk is like to be for any one of these proposed solutions that we have in here. Based on those solutions, uh, we're also able to go in and make some proposals as to what the landscape is going to look like if we're making changes uh, to the applications to retire and replace those. So for example, in here, there's a landscape model that we can look at, and each one of these applications, if we uh, propose that they be decommissioned at a particular point in time, we can use what's called the slider bar here to slide across and say, what will the landscape look like at a particular period of time if we make some of these changes in here? So it's a dynamic way of being able to look at what the landscape is going to look like over a period of time. So armed uh, with this information, then we're able to not only just use the assessment scores that we have here, but have a full understanding of what the applications and the impact on the wider business is likely to be so that we can make informed uh, decisions about the recommendations for any one of those applications uh, that, um, that we're considering for retiring or replacing, etc. So based on those deep dive investigations that we're able to do against the applications and a, having a better understanding of the business context and the environment in which they operate in, uh, we can take a look at the visualizations of those applications just like we did before and come up with some uh, detailed recommendations as to what we want to do with those applications. And in our example again, uh, the same three applications here towards the bottom are applications uh, which are coming out or performing rather badly. So based on that and our understanding of the technical architectures that we've gained from system architects, we're able to propose a number of projects or uh, opportunities or solutions, call them what you may, to determine what we want to propose to do with those applications. And in this example here, uh, we've got a couple of uh, proposals that we've made and uh, we've got option one here which is saying what we're going to do is we're going to modernize the GMFS risk control application and retire TBRI risk charting applications, whereas option two is going to uh, really just look at retiring TBRI and replacing with GMFS risk control, i.e. in this option we're not going to uh, modernize the GMFS risk control uh, application. Now, just like before uh, we did for the applications, we're able to go in and take a look at these projects and um, assess the value of those. So, for example, how well does this particular uh, proposal fit architecturally to the needs of the business? How well is the strategic alignment? How well um, does this confer business value and competitive advantage? So we're able to look at uh, the a sort of a scorecard of uh, information uh, against this, but also take a look at well, what are the risks of uh, changing the, the business and uh, changing the IT risks uh, associated with this proposal in here. Now, at this point in time, what we're also interested in doing is working out uh, what are the overall financial benefits and costs associated with each one of these proposals that we're making in here. And what we're able to do here is to use a spread of expected costs and a spread of expected uh, benefits 
uh, or returns on the investment and use those as a way of being able to assess the value of each one of these proposals. So we can have a spreadsheet of the planned likely costs and benefits, uh, the planned high likely cost and the low likely cost and use that as a distribution spread to, to, to work out a mean net present value. So let's take a look at some of the details against this. So what this is telling us is for the option two that we've got, uh, there are certain numbers of license uh, costs that are going to be incurred against this, certain development costs with implementing this particular option in there. And had there been any other factors that we'd also wanted to uh, factor in, we would also be able to include those here. So everything that occurs up here are going to be costs, i.e. negative things that we're going to uh, incur as a cost, whereas here are benefits and savings that we're incurring in here. And we can do exactly the same for the planned likely, the planned low, and the planned high. So taking the overall information that we've got in there, we can come up with some sort of projected likelihood uh, based on the, uh, the, that spread of costs and benefits that we've got in here. And when we do this, uh, we can come up with a distribution curve which looks a little bit like this. And what this is telling us is that there's a particular break even point, i.e. there's a 71% probability that for this particular project we're going to break even and that there is a 10% chance that we're going to save or make something like about half a million dollars over the lifetime of this application. Now, that then gives us a degree of confidence uh, that if we're going to take this particular option, we're playing pretty safe, uh, that we're likely to be able to achieve these benefits, and the probability of doing that is, is reasonably high. Whereas if we take the first option that we had here and take a look at the costings against that and the likely confidence factors that we've got against that, then we can see in here that um, compared with option one, that the degree of confidence that we've got is not as great. I, there's only a 30% uh, probability that we're going to break even and there's only a 10% chance that we're going to make 250 dollars against this particular proposal. And uh, the proposal that we've got in here, option one, is the one uh, which involves a higher degree of risk as we're going to be modernizing one of the applications. And uh, obviously there's greater risk and there's greater costs and investment costs associated with taking each one of these options in here. Now, Armed with this information about how well uh, this applications uh, and the proposals fit to the needs of the business, we're then in a position to be able to make a judgment as to which one of these applications that we want to go and uh, proceed with. Now, having collected this information and being armed with it, just like with the applications, the proposals that we've got here, they are also subject to a, uh, a governance life cycle. So these uh, proposals here, or the projects, are currently proposed, but now that we've collected all of this information, we can proceed to the next stage and say, let's compare these uh, proposals with one another and assess those. And if I transition this to, the, to its next state, so that's option one, and option two, we'll do the same again. So now those uh, proposals have been uh, transitioned to their next stage and we can go and compare those proposals with one another and use the same techniques that we were doing before to look at uh, the relative merits of selecting each one of those applications and the associated uh, projects and proposals that we've got in there. So for those proposals that we have made, we need to be able to determine how well do those proposals fit in uh, to the scheduling uh, needs of the existing projects that we've got in place and uh, the resources that are available. Oh, and again, we can use focal point to help us to make this type of assessment and uh, judgment in here. So for the proposals that we've got for the options one and two here, we can see uh, that we've got information uh, which is telling us, or rather we've got dates in here, when they are likely to be planned. We can also see in here 
uh, that there's a distribution here and uh, what that's telling us is uh, that for all of the applications that we've got and the projects that we've got, the planned likely costs of changing those exceed the actual budget costs uh, that we've got. However, this is a little bit of an unfair um, comparison because some of these uh, projects and proposals that we've got, they are actually exclusive, i.e. you're not going to really be doing um, both of them, you're only going to be doing one or the other. And in addition to this, we should also be considering not just those groups which are mutually exclusive, but instead we should be looking at the complete set of projects, uh, proposals that, uh, that we have, and look at the planning of those against the business, availability of resources and costings. So if we were to say, let's take this particular option here, we can see that the overall uh, plan likely costs are obviously uh, reduced in this example, but if we were to go to the second option that we've got in here, that the plan likely costs exceed the budgetary costs that we've got in here. So if this is the case, then maybe uh, if we are going to be looking at the, uh, to make the profile fit in here of the availability of uh, costings versus the actual budgets that we've got, maybe what we can do is to look at how we can change the dates that we've got in here and plan these so that we can distribute uh, the, the costs over a different period of time. So we're able to use this type of roadmap view to help us to plan and balance uh, the available budgets that we've got, the available resources that we've got, and do some sort of preliminary planning against these applications and uh, the proposals. Now, this is not an example of how to do project portfolio management and execution. This is merely just a high-level planning of resources and costings and scheduling of those uh, proposed projects so that we can get a bit of an understanding of which ones we're likely to be able to achieve. So based on all the information that we have uh, been able to see, this is where uh, the information that we had uh, visible in our dashboard came from. It's by collecting the application information, making assessments, making proposals of those applications that we're able to use Focal Point to help us uh, make those assessments and uh, decisions in here, supported by the technical architectures that we're able to gain from within a system architect. So to summarize, a rational integrated solution for application portfolio management incorporates capabilities from enterprise architecture and blueprinting to provide portfolio management and decision support in a collaborative operating environment with the ultimate aim really to help you uh, build and maintain application portfolios by firstly defining and understanding the applications and making sure that they are aligned with the key business objectives. And this is supported by providing a deep understanding of the applications and also their relationships to the critical processes, strategic objectives, and the general technical architecture. And we're making sure that we only capture information at the right time, at the right level that is needed in a particular point in the life cycle in there. And the purpose being to drive the development and divesture decisions based on business priorities rather than ad hoc uh, driven requirements uh, based on uh, specific market uh, demands or needs at that particular point in time. And using the information that we have as a feedback mechanism to make sure that we are monitoring the progress using the performance indicators uh, measured against the application portfolio to make sure that we are achieving the objectives that we set out. So our integrated solution provides businesses with the ability to make sense of complex application portfolios and optimize their investments based on the specific objectives and criteria that they've got and enhancing the business profitability, whilst at the same time optimizing the solutions that are being implemented and uh, managing the risks inherent in any transformation exercise.